your first question comes from the line of Donovan Schaefer from Northland Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hey guys, um, so my first question is just on the incremental movement of, you know, initially talking about looking at strategic alternatives for the um, Hypertrack ERX business, <clears throat> and then now committing to a path of winding it down. Uh, first, just, um, you know, is this a case where you did go through conversations or, or uh, solicit or, or engage with you know, potential buyers, folks signed, uh, you know, NDAs and, and went through things and weren't able to, um, I guess, see the eye to eye on value? Or was this a case where you didn't even actually get to that point and, you know, maybe ran some numbers on a rough valuation or something and decided to not take that next step? Um, and then, you know, did you get a valuation from a third party of any kind? And if you could share that, um, that's that, that, that'd be the first question. Sure. So appreciate the questions, Donovan. Um, so we did run uh, a process. We engaged uh, Evercore as our bankers uh, to assist us with this process. And uh, we went out and had discussions with dozens of different groups out there and uh, explored um, you know, what strategic options there could be. That included looking at potential buyers. That included looking at potential industry roll-ups or mergers. And uh, upon conclusion of the, the process and looking at, um, you know, what came of it, uh, we decided the best interest for all stakeholders was this wind-down path and preserving the IP for potential later use. Uh, with that, I mean, I think that speaks a lot to just where the market is at right now. Uh, through these discussions, as I'm sure you can imagine, we had a lot of um, uh, discussions with potential strategic partners uh, or acquirers, and what we found was uh, they themselves are even assessing, you know, if they pull back uh, their own spend internally on electrification. Uh, just as we're seeing the slowdown in this electric market, uh, people are expecting adoption to take a lot longer. Uh, that also equates to people pulling back on their spend on electrification. In terms of others that are in the space, uh, other uh, parties that would be uh, comparable to Hylion, you know, new entrants into the space, where we've seen a lot of them file bankruptcy recently, uh, and then other ones are out trying to actively raise financing and uh, in many instances have not been successful with that. And so uh, all those factors led us to the decision of, uh, of this wind down. Okay, and then, um, you know, with turning to the Carno, um, I guess first, would there be um, the way you've done in the past for Hypertrack ERX? Do you see yourselves? Uh, you know, maybe this is something you plan to have at the time of the fireside chat. Like now that it's the focus, maybe giving us a more uh, granular and, and detailed kind of timeline on that path to commercialization. You know, any particular uh, tests or certifications? If there's the you know, EPA stationary source required stuff, you know, whatever, whatever is involved in that, do you think, do you think you'll give us, uh, are you planning on giving us a more granular breakdown there? Um, and, and one more there on Carno is just, how do we not repeat the same situation where with Hypertrack ERX, we talked a lot about excitement from customers. Um, and, you know, of course that changed. Is there, do you have any thoughts around a different approach that could make that stickier um, this time with, with Carno. Any color there would be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's start with the first one around uh, milestones around Carno. So I just want to highlight a couple here. So, uh, we expect that by end of this year, we'll start uh, having some discussions around who the initial adoption partners are going to be uh, with the Carno. And then as we go into next year, uh, middle of the year will be, uh, you know, kind of final validation of the system that then brings us into uh, actually starting customer deployments in the second half of next year. So uh, we probably will come back with some more granularity uh, around that. And, um, you know, whether that's in the fireside chat, uh, you know, we'll probably share some more details there. And then as we go into next year. Uh, just to set expectations. So those initial customer deployments, we're looking at you know low single uh, million, so a couple million of uh, of income that would be coming from those uh, the, or of revenue that would be coming from those uh, those deployments. So just want to kind of set expectations of those will be the initial entrance into the uh, the market. 
as we think about um, how to not uh, repeat the situation that we're in with powertrain, so you know, I think as we look at kind of the customer discussions on the powertrain side of things, uh, the the shift is kind of focused to since the cost of electric vehicles are higher up front, their thought is, is now they're going to wait to uh, till government mandates really come into place in order to force them to adopt it. Uh, you know, I think where we were a couple of years ago was even though the costs were more uh, up front, that uh, it was a strong freight market and, uh, and fleets were saying, yeah, we're going to get ahead of this. We want to focus on ESG and we want to start adopting electric. Uh, now there's more of a, a pullback. It's a weak freight market. Uh, and the, the weight is or the push is let's wait till government mandates are there. Um, as we look at the generator market, uh, this is already an existing market that we're stepping into, right, versus electric vehicles. Uh, there are you know, very few number of electric semi trucks that are out on the road versus uh, generators. It's a pretty established market already that we're stepping into, and we're bringing a very competitively differentiated solution. Uh, this isn't a standard generator. Uh, it's not an internal combustion engine. Uh, it gives a lot of flexibilities like fuel agnostic, high efficiency, low emissions, low noise, low maintenance. Uh, and so it's, it really brings forward a lot of what, you know, the benefits of what a power plant has, but bringing it into a, a solution that's the size of a generator. So going after an already existing market and one where there are, are pain points from the customer's end where uh, people need electricity now and they just can't get it from the grid and they're being told they can't get grid hookups for one, two, three, or even more in some instances years. And uh, and that's the market that we feel like we can step in and address, which has a, a very prominent need, need right now. Okay, thank you. I'll take the rest of my questions offline. Your next question comes from line of Bill Peterson from JP Morgan. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for taking the, the questions. I'd like to get a little bit more details on uh, the history that led to the decision to, you know, to kind of wind down um, the efforts here. I mean, I think back over the last few years, there's, there indeed was a lot of excitement. You had the Founders Program. Um, you know, even four months ago, you were still, I mean, still talking about cost of ownership advantages and infrastructure advantages. So just trying to get a feel for like, how did, you know, how did this evolve and apparently come, I'm not saying it didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, obviously, uh, these, the fleet decisions are understandable given um, their own challenging times. But, you know, just the evolution of that and then at this stage looking ahead, how do you see the fleets really adopting any new technologies? Is it really going to be a 2027 story? Um, what do you think about the mix between the various options they have? Again, like the, the net gas generator option you had did have advantages in that there was a lot of infrastructure versus lack thereof of other infrastructure, especially given the student, uh, you've actually provided such great information across the landscape, whether it be bed, fuel cell, uh, you know, hydrogen, and so forth. Um, how, do you, how should we uh, think of this evolving from here? Sure. So a little history on it uh, of kind of getting to this decision. So you know, we still had customer interest and engagement and uh, and even fleets, you know, are, are, we're doing fleet trials. And, uh, and one thing I want to really reiterate is this was not a decision based on product performance or having reliability issues or, or things like that. Uh, actually, you know, we've been very, very pleased with how the product was outperforming in fleets' hands, and we were seeing, hearing that same feedback from fleets. Uh, but I think this what has really happened is the market has shifted to fleets are saying, you know, with these vehicles costing a lot more up front uh, than diesel trucks, uh, and as shared, you know, we've been experiencing those price increases as well in our components and, you know, having discussions with fleets about passing those costs on. Fleets are, are expressing that they're going to really slow down their rate of adoption until they wait for the government mandates to force the adoption. And as you pointed out, that probably is a later this decade type of a situation. And one other thing that gives us concern is there's a lot of discussions out there right now about those government mandates potentially even softening or changing or becoming uh, elongated as to when fleets really need to adopt electric. And so uh, as we look at the position we were in, uh, we're more approaching this from a position of strength as opposed to a position of weakness where we're fortunate that we have a strong balance sheet and a strong cash position. And we have two really strong technologies within the company. We had Powertrain and Carno. And uh, Powertrain is facing some of these hurdles that we mentioned of the demand changing, the cost of com components going up, and the regulatory side of things. 
And as we look at the Carnot uh, market opportunity, we see it as a more capital efficient path to market. Uh, we're going to be delivering initial customer units next year in the second part of the year. So uh, that's what led us to look at, you know, the, we've got, uh, as we closed out last quarter, $324 million of cash available to us. And uh, we feel like it's the, the best decision to put, you know, focus on the uh, the Carnot go forward, take the, the powertrain technology, preserve it, put it on the shelf for potential later use, uh, and then uh, for the time being, focus on Carno. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, well understood. Uh, you know, on, on Carno, just trying to get a more bigger picture view on how you're viewing the competitive landscape for, you know, the stationary power uh, market. We're, we're hearing early use cases like around EV charging. We've heard people talk about data center backup. Um, you know, Customers, there's different different business models and way to approach it, uh, whether it be, um, you know, turnkey solutions, generator plus fuel. Try to get a feel for how you see the landscape um, for this and what you're going to be focusing on over the next few years. Sure. So uh, there's there's a couple of different markets when you think about the power generation side of things. And maybe to start off with just clarifying. So uh, you know we're looking at being a, a generator of electricity um, versus you know some of these solutions that you mentioned, like a battery is more going to to help with uh, with saving uh, conserving electricity and then being able to use it at, at a later date. As we think about you know what is really needed, uh, we think it is both, but there's a lot of demand for just more electricity production, especially as you think about you know the the EV space. Um, you know more chargers are being deployed, uh, substations don't have the electricity available to actually service the, some of these chargers in inst in some instances, and we're enabling an opportunity where we could just bring a generator out and actually produce electricity locally at that site. There are a lot of other companies in this space. Uh, some are using more conventional internal combustion engines in order to produce that electricity. And then some others are using things like fuel cells in order to produce electricity. Uh, what we what we see is our advantage is, you know, an internal combustion engine does not have great efficiency, requires a lot of maintenance. Um, and from an emissions and pollution standpoint, many are still running on diesel fuel, and, uh, and that's not great for our environment, right? I don't think we want EV chargers that are, uh, are sitting there being powered by a diesel generator. So uh, we're looking at the Carnot solution as bringing many benefits uh, from an emissions and pollution standpoint, similar to what a fuel cell brings forward, uh, but we're, we're bringing it with low maintenance and a cost that we are looking at coming in a lot less than where fuel cells are at. So uh, as mentioned before, it's kind of bringing forward many benefits that normally you see in a power plant, uh, but bringing it forward in a size like a, a conventional generator that can be deployed locally and, uh, and produce your own electricity at a cost affordable rate. All right, thanks for that. I'll, I'll drop back in the queue. And again, if you would like to ask a question, press star and the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from the line of, from Andres Shepard from Cantor Fitzgerald. Your line is open. Hey guys, this is Anand on for Andres. Thanks for taking our question. Um, so we were just wondering with respect to the Carno generator, what you would um, expect uh, revenue to look like into commercialization and um, prior to commercialization as, we, as we're in that period right now. Sure. So commercialization will start at the later part of next year. And as mentioned, it was, we're expecting, you know, just a couple of million of revenue coming in next year from that solution. As we get uh, further into this transition, obviously, you know, we're just announcing it today. Uh, so as we get into next year, uh, the first half of next year, we plan on coming back and being able to share more on uh, what we think the future projections of it are. Uh, the generator space, the production of electricity market is a is a huge market. So this is not a, uh, a market size issue by any means. This is a, a huge addressable market we're going after, um, but we plan on coming back uh, in the first half of next year with uh, projections on what we're expecting from an adoption rate standpoint. Got it. Appreciate the color. And with respect to uh, pricing and uh, competitors, how do you expect to see pricing for the Carnot generator and comparable products and services? 
So we'll come back with more granularity on this, but I just wanted to kind of give some directional numbers. So we are going to be uh, more expensive than a conventional diesel engine, um, you know, an internal combustion engine, but we, we're looking at being substantially less than uh, some of the other solutions like fuel cells that are coming out to the market. But as mentioned, bringing forward a lot of the benefits of those other solutions like the ability to run on hydrogen, having that low maintenance side of things. So, um, so I think this is going to be a pretty attractive and compelling solution for, uh, for the space. Now, uh, it's going to be important for us to focus on where do we deploy these, right? In the beginning, it doesn't make sense for us to go, by, go after market opportunities like standby power generation or emergency you know, operation where the generator kicks on for one or two hours a year. Uh, though that, you know, we suspect that the conventional diesel engine is going to uh, still be the solution there, at least for the time being. Uh, but we see our, our opportunity being more uh, prime power applications where someone wants to become less dependent on the grid and actually make their own electricity. We see uh, peak shaving opportunities, the ability to be able to take flare gas and convert that into electricity, take uh, pollution coming off of landfills, produce electricity with that, uh, you know, operations where you're going to really utilize the generator and have a high, high uptime of it. That's where we see the Carno being significantly differentiated. Uh, and the great news is there's plenty of, uh, of opportunities that can utilize that. You know, think about uh, warehouses, hotels, hospitals. Those are all applications that we see the Carno generator being a great fit. Got it. Appreciate it. And just the last really quick and easy one, if I could, um, I just wanted to make sure I have this right. You're not expecting to deliver any of the 30 trucks in the order book or hybrid trucks going forward. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So we, we won't generate any more revenue from the powertrain business um, from from selling hybrid systems or or the, the production trucks we talked about. Um, you know that that business is being wound down. Gotcha. Sounds good. Thanks again for taking our questions. I'll pass it on. Your next question comes from a line of Sean Kai from UPS. Your line is open. Hi, uh, hi guys. Thanks for taking my question. So just one very quick question. What, what, what will be your sales outlook for Kano in 2025? So sales of, uh, of the Carno generator in 2025, we'll come back uh, with more information on that in the uh, the first half of next year. Uh, you know, at this stage, I've given some directional numbers of you know a couple million in revenue next year from uh, from the Carno is expected in the the second half of next year. Uh, but as mentioned, you know, we're just starting this uh, this transition now. Obviously, it was just announced today, and so we'll be coming back with uh, with more granularity on on future projections. Yeah, just just to add to that, so as Thomas mentioned, the units next year are are deployments with with initial real you know real customers that are going to use them for uh, that will provide power benefits. Uh, we'll still be doing R and D at the time, uh, but you can imagine after that we'll start ramping up those deployments. And uh, as Thomas mentioned, we'll have some, a little bit better visibility as we uh, you know make this strategic shift and. And kind of reevaluate as we're shifting resources over from powertrain to Carno, what that looks like. But uh, clearly, we're not. You know, we're just going to be ramping up from what we expect deliveries to be next year. That'll be a good starting point for you know for continued growth. Thank you. Very helpful. And this concludes the question and answer portion of today's call. At this time, I would like to turn the conference back over to Hylion CEO Thomas Healy for some final closing remarks. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, news shared on, on today's earnings call around uh, the, the discontinuation of our powertrain business, putting that technology uh, on the shelf, preserving it for potential later use, and the, the pivot to, to focusing in, on the Carno generator for our go-forward strategy for the time being. Um, we do believe that this is the, the right shift for, uh, for the company, for stakeholders and shareholders, and uh, we're excited to, uh, to go execute on this path forward and, uh, and look to share this, uh, this exciting story as we continue on with, uh, with our shareholder base. So thank you for joining today and uh, more to come in the quarters ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's conference call. You may all disconnect and have a wonderful day.